What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. Today, we are going to be doing something that we have not done on this channel in a good little while, and that's going to be a DM's Guild review. Now, DM's Guild review is material that is published over on DM's Guild that is not officially sponsored by Wizards of the Coast, but is still of a very high quality of content that is homebrewed. And previously trying to review all of that content was getting a little bit too expensive for me to be able to continue doing. However, R. Morgan Slade, a creator over on DM's Guild, reached out to me and sent me a copy of their new subclass, the College of the Crow's Nest Bard, for me to review specifically. So that's what we're going to do today. So this is the College of the Crow's Nest Bard, a very intriguing looking subclass based on the art done here. Now there is a lot to go through here, so let's just jump right into it. Beginning with the College of the Crow's Nest Bard, Crow's Nest Bards revel in the journey navigating the trials of adventure with intuition and perseverance as they pursue relics and rarities as a catalyst for journeys abound, cultivating a lifetime of memories from which they draw treasures of untold strength alongside their faithful, familiar companion. We will get into the familiar mechanics of this subclass later down below. So let's get started right away with the bonus proficiencies. When you join the College of the Crow's Nest at third level, you gain proficiency in history, vehicles, only water vehicles, so ships specifically, and navigators tools. A very unique blend there. There might be some other vehicles that I can't necessarily think of right now that are water-based, but if you guys can think of anything else, let me know in the comments. Next up, we have the Crow's Nest Familiar. When you join the College of the Crow's Nest at third level, you learn the spell Find Familiar. It does not count toward your total spells known, and your familiar can also adopt forms included within this supplement, down later below. The additional forms there include Armadillo, Axolotl, Canine, Chameleon, Electric Eel, Fennec Fox, Macaw, Marmoset, Opossum, Otter, Pelican, Pufferfish, Scorpion, Spider Monkey, and Wildcat. A lot of different familiars to choose from, very nice. In addition, as an action, you can expend one of your uses of Bardic Inspiration to change your familiar's form from any of the animals listed here. Any material components needed for the spell are still required to change the familiar's form and using Bardic Inspiration to do so. Very nice having that level of versatility, which the Bard is already known for very well. Moving on to Sot Treasures and Ethereal Keepsakes. Additionally, at third level, whenever you take a long rest, you can choose an item agreed upon with your DM to be your designated as your Sot Treasure. The focus of your latest treasure hunt. This item must require attunement and cannot be cursed. It must be of uncommon quality and cannot be a consumable and cannot be conventionally purchased. And you must not know of its exact location. <laughs> there is a lot of requirements here. You can choose items up to rare quality at 6th level, up to a very rare quality at 10th level, and up to a legendary quality at 14th level. Once you have chosen a sought treasure to pursue after you regain your spent Bardic Inspiration by finishing a short rest, you can choose to expend another Bardic Inspiration. If you choose to do so, your intuition confirms whether you are closer or farther from the sought treasure than you were at the location of your previous long rest. So basically, this effect sounds like you get to read a treasure map once every eight hours or once every day over the course of a long rest. I feel like maybe it should be a little bit sooner than that. I think that maybe after each short rest of a certain period of time, like maybe once every eight hours during a short rest, you should be able to do this. Because I feel like once every day, it's like you could feel like you just lost an entire day. I don't know. That might not feel too good to the players, but let's continue anyway. If you discover a sought treasure and it is not currently in its rightful resting place or secured by its rightful heirs, determined by the DM, you can attune to the item as normal, but you can't choose another sought treasure until your current one's returned to its rightful place. If a sought treasure in your possession has not been returned to its rightful place after one month, you suffer one level of exhaustion, which cannot be removed as long as you are attuned to the sought treasure. That makes it sound like the item, regardless of whatever you pick, while it cannot be cursed, it sounds like it's cursed in and of its own right, just not being yours in general. I kind of like this. Once a sought treasure is either returned to its rightful resting place or in the possession of its rightful heirs, memories and tales from your latest treasure hunting adventures coalesce during your next long rest into an ethereal keepsake stored within your familiar's pocket dimension. Ethereal's keepsakes exist as perfect replicas of the original with several important additions. Whenever you summon your familiar, you can expend one of your bardic inspirations to retrieve an ethereal keepsake stored within the pocket dimension. Your familiar cannot retrieve an ethereal keepsake unless you are able to attune to it. The keepsake is considered immediately attuned to you. You can choose to return an ethereal keepsake to your familiar's pocket dimension as a bonus action. 
Only you can wield your ethereal keepsakes. Keepsakes act as their material plane counterparts under normal circumstances, but if another creature were to attempt to wear or wield the ethereal keepsakes, the item would slip through their grasp. Each ethereal keepsake in your position grants plus one bonus to your charisma score, up to a maximum of 20. If after you create an ethereal keepsake, you knowingly allow the matching original to be appropriated by anyone to whom it does not rightfully belong, your ethereal keepsake of that sought treasure ceases to exist until the time that the original is returned to its rightful place. Should you choose to abandon your pursuit of one sought treasure for another, you can do so during a long rest and awake with one level of exhaustion as the weight of your decision settles within you. You cannot pursue a previously abandoned sought treasure, and if you happen to come across it during your travels, you cannot attune to the item, nor can you create an ethereal keepsake of it. There is so much regarding just around finding treasure and all these mechanics. This is the most flavorful thing I think I've ever seen printed for Bard. I do feel like just with this third level ability, you pay a very heavy price for trying to look for treasure which maybe that is in theme but i think that maybe a buff could be warranted to something like maybe allowing a higher quality item to be sought if you're going to take this many risks with it like maybe start with a rare and work your way up to a legendary instead of starting at an uncommon but there are some there are pretty good uncommon items that could be worth going for even though all of this risk exists but again that's just my opinion Starting at level 6, you get the Familiar Aura. As long as you are familiar with the telepathic range of you, you can expend one of your Bardic Inspirations to create a 30-foot radius around your Familiar. Both you and any friendly creatures within the Aura benefit from any of the Familiar's traits, applying the benefits as if it were their own. This Aura lasts for one hour or until your Familiar is dismissed or drops to zero hit points. For example, the Armadillo has the following trait. Guarded. The Armadillo takes no damage from non-magical weapons or non-magical environmental hazards until the start of its next turn after using the ready action. In this instance, any non-hostile creatures within your Armadillo's familiar active take no damage from non-magical weapons or non-magical environment hazards after using the ready action. Now, I'm not entirely certain on the wording of this, but it sounds like if the Armadillo uses the guarded ready action, does that effect of all creatures taking no non-magical damage apply to everyone or does everybody else have to take the ready action to not take damage i'm a little bit confused on the wording but if it's the first one then that's extremely busted <laughs> but it, it, i would assume for the sake of balancing that each creature would have to take the ready action as well to get the no no damage effect but even if that is the case, this is still a really nice ability with a buff aura, a more of a support type play style. I do really like this. Next up, we have Treasure Vault. Starting at 6th level, when you regain your uses of Bardic Inspiration at the end of a long rest, you regain a number of uses equal to your Grisma Modifier plus the number of Ethereal Keepsakes you possess. Starting at 10th level, whenever a friendly creature spends one of your Bardic Inspiration dice, treat the die roll as the total number of Ethereal Keepsakes in your possession as if the roll is below that amount. So being a hoarder pays off. You can basically guarantee a certain roll on a Bardic Inspiration die, which is already really nice since you can roll quite low on those dice. So very nice, safe ability here. Not too complicated. It's simple. I like it. Next up at 14th level, we have Familiar Bond. Starting at 14th level, when your Familiar would take damage when it, while it is within telepathic range, you can choose to expend one of your Bardic Inspiration die as a reaction to take the damage as though you were the original target. So you can take the hit for your familiar, which would likely go down in a single hit if these stat blocks are all to be taken by with only two hit points on most of these familiars. This is a really nice ability to keep your support familiar up. Although if you don't have a lot of HP, you should probably use this ability sparingly. So with that in mind, let's move on to the next ability, Treasure Trove. Starting at 14th level, if your familiar is within telepathic range of you, after a friendly creature within 30 feet of you adds up your Bardic Inspiration die to an ability check, attack roll, save, or saving throw, but before the DM says whether the roll succeeds or fails, you can immediately expend one of your Bardic Inspiration as a reaction to dismiss and resummon your familiar in an unoccupied space adjacent to that creature. Choose one stored ethereal keepsake for your familiar to retrieve. The creature becomes attuned to this item, and this attunement does not count against the maximum of items the creature can attune to. If any traits of the attuned ethereal keepsake could influence the creature's impending roll, those traits are immediately applied. If the creature makes an attack roll and the keepsake is a weapon, add the keepsake's damage and effects to any damage roll that provided the attack succeeded. At the end of the creature's turn, the ethereal keepsake disappears back into your familiar's pocket dimension. You cannot use this ability again until you finish a long rest. So the first thing that comes to mind with this ability is sending your familiar back into the pocket dimension and pulling out like a magical armor that has like a plus two bonus to AC and just like 
instantaneously applying better armor onto a target that's about to be attacked just so it doesn't take the hit. I think that this is a really funny and flavorful ability to just apply in combat at any moment, and I think you could have some crazy moments just from this treasure trove ability. And at 14th level, your ethereal keepsake in Saw Treasure could potentially be a legendary item, which could turn the tide of something that could happen in combat. There are so many possibilities with this ability alone. I love this. So moving on, let's take a look at the familiar options. I'm not going to go over necessarily everything about all of these, but we're going to look at their specific abilities to see what you could benefit from with the abilities listed above while the familiar is active in play. Starting off with the Armadillo, we already went over this one. The Armadillo takes no damage from non-magical weapons and non-magical environmental hazards until the start of its next turn after using the Ready action. Only two hit points with an AC of 12. The Axolotl has natural resistance. The Axolotl is immune to poison, disease, and petrification effects. A really powerful ability on a very small creature. We have Canine Quick Reflexes. If the Canine has not moved more than five feet since the start of their last turn and has already used a reaction, the Canine can choose to make an opportunity attack against a creature that moves out of their reach. So it sounds like, so it sounds like the Canine can take a second opportunity attack outside of their reaction that they might have already burned, which is really nice, and applying this to all of your party members is also pretty good. Moving on to the Chameleon, we have Camouflage. If the Chameleon remains touching the same surface for at least one minute uninterrupted, the Chameleon becomes invisible until it either moves onto a different surface or makes an attack. So imagine giving your entire party invisibility in a very like specific stealth scenario just by having this chameleon out and everybody being within a 30 foot radius this is proving to be a lot more powerful than i expected it to be and i'm a fan of this quite a bit electric eel is next with recoil whenever the electric eel is grappled by a creature it can make an, a melee attack against that creature as a reaction if the melee attack hits the grapple ends so for party members who aren't necessarily versed in the ways of strength and being able to beat grapple checks just being able to land an attack automatically ending a grapple could be useful in a lot of scenarios. Next up, we have Fennec Fox with Fennec Ears. The Fennec Fox has an advantage on intelligence and wisdom checks that rely on hearing and can hear the presence of magical items up to 60 feet. A five foot barrier between the fox and the sound obstructs this ability. So in the open, in a treasure hoard, in a dungeon somewhere, you will be able to hear the presence of magical items, which for this specific bard subclass who likes to hunt item magical items, very fitting indeed. Next up, we have Macaw. Quick study. If the Macaw hears the verbal component of a cantrip requiring only verbal components, the Macaw can memorize the verbal component as a reaction. Then as an action, the Macaw can cast the cantrip. The Macaw forgets the verbal component once dismissed. When its hit points are reduced to zero or if it memorizes a new verbal component. So essentially, you can cast your cantrips from a separate source, which has been done before, but also giving this ability to all of your other compatriots who maybe other spellcasters could also use your familiar to cast spells from. Could You could set up a nice little turret of a familiar macaw just in a zone that can cast things like Firebolt or Eldritch Blast and just cast all of them at the same time. Pretty interesting. Next up, we have the Possum. Play dead ag attacks against the Possum made with disadvantage until the start of its next turn after using the ready action. So I am starting to think that likely what I said above was probably incorrect about just gaining the benefits without having to do these things yourself as in like you wouldn't be able to use this ability without taking the ready action as a different party member you would also have to take the ready action i'm starting to understand this better now and it does make this a lot more balanced the warding just seemed off to me initially but this is still a really good ability and party members who ne do not necessarily have in things that they need to do could take the ready action and gain massive benefits which is really nice overall Next up, we have the Marmoset, which is alert. The Marmoset is always considered to be facing an attacking creature. It is immune to sneak attack and cannot be surprised as long as it is conscious. This is fantastic for just the ability of taking rests, taking short rests, never being able to be surprised on or be vulnerable to sneak attacks. This one is just good overall. And because you can use this Robotic Inspiration die to change the form of your familiar the second you are ready to rest you can just make it become the marmoset and you are set to go very nice next up we have the otter with swift current after the otter makes an attack while swimming it can immediately disengage as a bonus action very niche ability still could be good in very certain circumstances next up we have the pelican with the gular pouch 
Any items small enough to fit safely inside the Pelican's beak cannot be forcibly removed as long as the Pelican is conscious. This doesn't seem that useful to me. Next up, we have the Pufferfish. Reflexive spines. Whenever a creature makes a melee attack against the Pufferfish, it can immediately make a melee attack as a reaction. Giving this to every party member would be pretty powerful. This is definitely one of the better ones. Next up, we have Scorpion with Undetected. The Scorpion is considered invisible in dim light or darkness to creatures without dark vision. Another stealth-based one. So giving all of your party members this in a very dark area is quite good. So I would definitely like to use this one in any sort of stealth circumstance. Probably even over the invisibility one, just because this one has more maneuverability as you are allowed to move. Next up, we have the Spider Monkey which is agile when the spider monkey uses the dash action it gains an additional 15 feet of movement so if you and your entire party need to go fast make it a spider monkey get an additional 15 feet wildcat we have attentive the wildcat is aware of any creature it can see attempting a dexterity stealth or sleight of hand check and automatically succeeds on wisdom perception checks to notice them and this is the final familiar the ability to be a jack of all trades even if you weren't allowed to change your familiar's form with an action with Bardic Inspiration die, this would still be absolutely crazy on the amount of variability you could get. Being able to just excel in almost every scenario with this many different familiars that give their ability to every party member as long as they are within 30 feet. This is a crazy subclass. I would not call this necessarily broken as it would take a good amount of resources from the bard itself to change the familiar to give the effects to their party should circumstances change. But this is still a really powerful support-based subclass, which is surprising considering this is a subclass surrounded around the concept of treasure hunting and kind of selfishness in a way. So being able to give your entire party limitless potential with all these familiar auras is something that is very appealing to me as someone who loves variety and down here are some adventure hooks i'll briefly just go over one or two of these we have something like the rich socialite revels in the inherited collection of rare treasures on display within their illustrious mansion unaware the bard's sought treasure was originally the key component to a warding spell that serves as the only protection for a descendant of a family doomed to terrible luck so long as the item is not in their possession once the relic is returned to the unlucky descendant the bard may manifest their ethereal keepsake so you have in a whole whole page of different adventure hooks you could take with trying to take the items for yourself these are very well written i'm not going to go over all of these but we also do have a ethereal keepsakes expanded page which at the dm's discretion a sought treasure can become enhanced beyond the additional properties of an ethereal keepsake depending on the overall strength and versatility of the item bearing in mind that ethereal keepsakes already bestow wondrous and enhancements over the physical counterparts and are already incredible rewards should a DM choose to grant additional abilities or modify their existing attributes of an ethereal keepsake, consider inspiration from the highlights of the Crow's Nest Bard's journey whenever possible. In addition, you may take inspiration from the table and additional options below or invent your own. So these options right here are already making the risk, the high risk placed on these types of rewards much more worth it than I originally reviewed above. An increase to a relevant ability score, attack and damage, or AC, advantage versus a relevant ability check or saving throw, all the way down to an increase in movement speed or initiative, or access to a relevant feat while the keepsake is attuned, gaining additional feats. This has now become a much more worthy subclass to get into. I originally did say that there was too much risk involved and not enough reward, but the fact that you could give somebody a much more powerful version of the item that they are already going for does definitely make this worth it in my opinion and speaking of treasure that you're gonna be looking for we already have some new treasures added in this in this homebrew starting with the shovel of the sot an uncommon club which does 1d8 bludgeoning damage and creatures whose hit points are reduced to zero by this shovel are considered knocked unconscious and stabilized the wielder can choose to concentrate for one minute and suffer one level of exhaustion an exhausted creature can choose to send any earth or sediment dug up by the shovel to the ethereal plane an exhausted creature can choose to activate one or several of the following abilities while holding the shovel. They can cast Detect Magic for once per day, Identify once per day, and Unseen Servant once per day. If this item exists as an ethereal keepsake, you can choose to collect heaps of soil, sand, and gravel from the ethereal plane at a rate of 5 cubic feet every 10 minutes. In addition, you can choose to send Earth or Sediment dug up by the shovel to the ethereal plane. Now, I'm not entirely certain what the point of sending a bunch of dirt to the ethereal plane is. Casting each of these once per day is okay, but you're also suffering one level of exhaustion 
while you choose to do so. I don't think that this would be worth it at base. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's just my opinion. Next up, we have Pickaxe of the Sot, which is a war pick of Uncommon that was 1d8 force damage. The wielder can same, become exhausted after concentrating for one minute. An exhausted creature deals double damage to objects and structures with the pickaxe and can also cast Detect Magic, identify an unseen servant for one day. This item exists as an ethereal keepsake. If this item exists as an ethereal keepsake, increase the damage die to 1d10. In addition, this pickaxe deals double damage to objects and structures. While you have at least one level of exhaustion, any damage to objects with this pickaxe is tripled instead. As While it is your ethereal keepsake, so a very siege weapon type of pickaxe, which is interesting. Next up, we have Whip of the Sot, an uncommon whip that does 1d4 slashing and 1d4 thunder. The wielder can choose to concentrate and become exhausted. An exhausted creature wielding this cannot be disarmed, receives a plus five to grapple checks with the whip, and can also cast Detect Magic and Identify an Unseen Servant once per day. If this item is your ethereal keepsake, you can change the damage type of each d4 during a short rest to either bludgeoning force, piercing slashing, or thunder damage. Should you choose the same damage type for both d4s, roll an additional d4 for that damage type. In addition, you are immune to disarm attempts as long as you are attuned to the whip and receive plus five to grapple checks with the whip. Now, is that a plus five on top of the already plus five you get to plus 10? Or is that just reiterating the fact that you would automatically get plus five? I'm not entirely sure, but you could have potentially three d4 of one damage type with a whip, which is really strong. That's better than a D12. That's better than 2D6 even. So that is a very powerful whip that you could get. And just being uncommon is pretty nice. Next up, we have Cutlass of the Sot. Scimitar uncommon with 1D8 slashing damage. You can suffer one level after concentrating for one minute of exhaustion. To an exhausted creature, the blade surface appears as a clean mirror and any magical effects glow with a faint aura when gazed upon through the Cutlass's reflective surface. Exhausted creature deals double damage to objects and structures with a scimitar. Very interesting. An exhausted creature can choose to activate, detect magic, identify our unseen servant once per day. If the item exists as an ethereal keepsake, you can choose to mark one creature dealt damage by a successful attack with this weapon, treating the creature's AC as its base amount before modifiers and ignoring the, any resistance to the weapon damage once per day. This ability cannot be used again until after you finish a long rest. In addition, the blade service always appears as a clean mirror and any magical effects glow with a faint aura when gazed upon through the reflective surface. Okay, so after reading this, it does appear that this is just a reiteration of what the item already does rather than an additive bonus, which would make sense <laughs> to plus 10 to grapple checks is insane. So moving on, we have Flintlock of the Sot Pistol Uncommon, 1d4 bludgeoning plus 1d4 piercing, one minute for one level of exhaustion, can cast different spells, an exhausted creature can cast the following spells through the barrel of the pistol, costing no ammunition, requiring only the pistol as a component. Firebolt, Chill Touch, True Strike, or Spare the Dying once per day. True Strike is not a good cantrip. Let's just get that right out of the way. Uh, Spare the Dying, also kind of weak. Chill Touch and Firebolt, however, are pretty nice. Only once per day, though. For the purposes of spellcasting this pistol, you can use Dexterity as your spellcasting ability. Now, that is better. If this item exists as an ethereal keepsake, this flintlock magically creates its own ammunition and is always considered loaded and cannot misfire. In addition, the following spells can also be cast through the pistol. Ray of Frost and Blade Ward once per day. Ray of Frost being the better of the two here. Misfire. Whenever you make an attack roll with this firearm, the dice and the dice roll is equal to or lower than the weapon's misfire score of two. The weapon misfires. The attack misses and the weapon cannot be used again until you spend an action to try and repair it. To repair your firearm, you must make a successful DC 10 Tinkerer's Tools check. If your check fails, the weapon is broken and must be mended out of combat to add a quarter of the cost of the firearm. Creatures who use a firearm without being proficient increase the weapon's misfire score by one. So misfiring is a very low probability. Still can happen unless it is your ethereal keepsake. So if you get this as your ethereal keepsake reward, it becomes much better than it already is. Next up, we have Boots of the Deckhand, a wondrous item uncommon. While you wear these boots, you can click the heels of the boots together two ice per day. To activate them for the next 10 minutes, your boots will refuse to lift off the ground if the resulting step would lead you into harm's way. You can't be knocked back, knocked prone, or moved by other forces or creatures, and the boots refuse to lift from the ground if the resulting step will not support your weight, cause you to fall prone, deal damage to you, teleport you, or shift you into another plane of existence. So basically, you become completely trap immune, which is great. 
If you jump, swim, fly, or crawl while the boots are activated, the effect immediately ends. If this item exists as an ethereal keepsake, wearing these boots also gives you plus one to your AC. So these are basically boots of trap immunity, which is very nice for it only being an uncommon item if you like to go dungeoneering. Uh, next up, we have the Tricorn of Composure. Another uncommon item. While wearing this tricorn, you have plus one to your AC. Whenever you gain a level of exhaustion, you can choose which effective exhaustion from the exhaustion effects table to apply. You cannot apply an effective exhaustion you already are affected by, and these effects remain until the exhaustion is removed, even if the tricorn is removed. In addition, whenever you remove a level of exhaustion, you can choose which effect of exhaustion to remove. If this item exists as an ethereal keepsake and you currently have two or more level of exhaustion, wearing this tricorn allows you to remove one level of exhaustion once per day after finishing a short rest. So with this item, the high risk, high reward of taking levels of exhaustion becomes a lot less risky as you can basically manipulate the type of exhaustion you have, taking whatever you might not need at the at a current time. Basically, you could take like your movement speed gets halved instead of having disadvantage on all ability checks or attack rolls this item is absolutely necessary if you're going to take any of these other items that give you levels of exhaustion next up is spyglass of the crow's nest another uncommon item if you are greater than one mile away from your current sought treasure the view through the spyglass lens becomes crisp and clear as long as you are looking in its general direction once you're within one mile of your sought treasure the view through the spyglass is crisp and clear in every direction if you currently do not have a chosen sought treasure the view through the spyglass appears cloudy and fogged if this item exists as an ethereal keepsake peering through the spyglass while you are within one mile of your sought treasure also reveals invisible creatures objects and magics within your line of sight and you have advantage on intelligence investigation checks while using the spyglass in addition you can examine an item through the spyglass and cast identify once per day without components a very useful item overall Again, fits in with the theme of treasure hunting. Couldn't really ask for more than that. And now we move on to an optional feat. This book is packed. We have Crow's Nest Familiar Expansion. Your connection with your familiar grows and you can expand the forms available for your fine familiar spell to include forms located within this supplement. In addition, starting at sixth level, as long as your familiar is within telepathic range of you, you can expend a first level spell slot as an action to create a 30 foot radius around your familiar. Both you and any non-hostile creatures gain the benefits so basically, a feat that gives any caster that can cast Find Familiar all of the Crow's Nest Familiars, as well as the ability to get the Radius of Aura to give all of your allies the benefits. This is a very good feat for any spellcaster to take. Just from the possible effects you can get from this that we mentioned above, this feat is crazy. And then we have optional spells, three of them. We have Fool's Folly, an evocation cantrip, which is a ritual cast, so over the course of 10 minutes. Duration lasts uh, for one hour with concentration. Fallen souls call out with warnings from the grave. For the next hour, you feel a cold chill ripple through, the, th ripple through you whenever you step within 10 feet of the location of a humanoid creature's demise. You learn how recently the creature's death occurred and which type of damage dealt the final blow. If the creature's death occurred within the last 50 years, you learn the creature's class and level. If the creature died within the last 10 years, you also learn the creature's name and last words. If the death occurred within the past year, you may choose to end concentration on the spell in order to witness the creature's final moments through their eyes. This cantrip is crazy. For something you can do over the course of 10 minutes for one hour, walking through a dungeon, you can basically play play Trap Monkey uh, for your party. If you already have the boot, if you did, for some reason don't have those boots that also serve as trap guides, this cantrip is just great to have. There aren't a lot of really useful cantrips that exist. I think this one could be very powerful in the eyes of especially a bard. Next up, we have Captain's Prerogative. Captain's Prerogative, just a little typo right there. First level Conjuration, casting time one reaction, which you take whenever you or a creature within five feet are hit with a melee attack. Self range, duration instant. When you are hit with a melee attack while another creature is within five feet of you, you can attempt to swap places with the creature but before damage. If the creature is willing, you and the creature swap places and it takes the damage from the melee attack. If the creature is unwilling, make a strength check contested by the creature's strength check. If you fail, the spell fizzles. Likewise, when a creature within five feet of you is hit with a melee attack, you can swap places with it, causing the attack to hit you instead. If the creature is unwilling, make a strength check against the other strength check. If you fail, the spell fizzles. Swapping places with a creature as a result of the spell does not provoke opportunity attacks of, of either yourself or the creature. So can you use this spell to swap places with a creature that's attacking you? If it, if they're within melee range? Because it doesn't say you can't. So it sounds like if a creature comes out, hits you with a sword, 
you can react and basically just make it so they get hit with their own attack i'm guessing no for the purposes of just just being a first level spell but maybe if so this spell is crazy and every single caster should take this <laughs> i don't really know what else to say about this one uh finally we have incite mutiny a second level enchantment one action 60 feet range concentration over the course of 10 minutes your quick thinking befuddles a leader causing their followers to question their authority the creature must make a charisma saving throw and on a failure the creature is subjected to the following effects for the duration of the spell the affected creatures make a charisma saving throw every time it attempts to issue an order command or request to one of its allies or if they attempt to cast a spell that includes the effect of charming a creature on a failure, the request is refused, and the creature will not take any action that would comply with the attempted orders given for the duration of a spell. When this spell ends, the creature knows it was affected by the spell. So, anti-boss the spell right here. I think that this could be really good in any scenario where you're not just fighting a single target. Any creature that can charm, I'm imagining something like fighting a vampire that could cast like charm person or something similar that might have thralls that they would issue commands to. This is a very niche ability to use, but I think it could be fun in the right circumstances. But that is going to do it for this very, very long and in-depth new supplement from the DMs Guild, College of the Crow's Nest Bard. Again, thank you so much to R. Morgan Slade for sending me a complimentary copy of this subclass for review. There is a lot here. I think that there could be entire adventures written around this subclass. I am a big fan of this. Again, I did initially believe that there were some things that required buffing, but after seeing just the effects and abilities of ethereal keepsakes, as well as giving all of your party really powerful, just passive up to active abilities from your familiar, this class is crazy. I don't really know exactly what I would change about it. Normally I try to think of something that I could change, but there's a lot here. So I guess overall, all I can say on this is Good job! But that is going to do it for me today, guys. This was a long one. This video is probably going to be really long, so hopefully you guys stuck through it all the way till the end. If you did enjoy this video, be sure to leave it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. As a final note, guys, expect a lot more videos coming soon at a much more consistent rate as I am going to have my first day off of work in about seven months coming up in a few weeks here, so expect a lot more uploads after that point. But until next time, guys... Have fun, stay safe, and as always, happy gaming.